Hello, my name is Chaz and I'm working on a 1-bit survival roguelike for Android. This week, we get to work on a lot of systems that finish out the MVP, or minimum viable product of the game. The minimum viable product is like the smallest vertical slice of the game that you can finish to show to other people for playtesting or for looking at publishers and demoing. For me, this includes the item system, the game master, and enemy design. With that, let's get developing. We left off last week with the item system. The item system is based off of object-oriented programming and inheritance. Essentially, every item in the game can be used, but each subclass can define what it means for the item to be used. I worked on the first item called the ammo item. You may have seen this last week. This item is a subclass of something called the trigger item. A trigger item is simply any item that gets used when the player walks into it. In this case, the player refills their ammo to the max ammo count, and the UI is updated. After that, I got to work on the health item. This was easy to implement since it was the same behavior as the ammo item. The player gets healed when they walk into it. The next thing I needed to figure out was spawning the resource items into the game. Rather than randomly drop health or ammo pickups across the map, I wanted the player to feel suspense on what item they would get, like loot chests and RPGs. So I designed the item box. This is essentially a loot chest that randomly spawns a resource. For now, it will only spawn health or ammo pickups. Later on, it might spawn game currency for purchasing upgrades or maybe weapons. I wanted to keep the design of the UI minimal, so interactions are made implicitly by having the player just walk into the item box to open it rather than click a button or UI prompt. I created the animations for the item box opening, which was a little difficult to do. Using a few pixels, it looks like the box has been opened. Then, when the box opens, an item spawns out of the chest and is dropped onto the maze. The last step was to choose a random place to spawn the item in each level. This is easy because my maze algorithm makes a list of dead ends and pathways while it's making the level. I decided to prioritize spawning the item boxes in dead ends. That way the player has to seek them out and has a risk walking down dead-end hallways. At this point, I also added a new dithering effect that obscures objects that are far away. Now the player will be unable to tell if the item they see in the distance is a lurking zombie or a valuable item box. If you recall from the previous video, the objective of the game is for the player to find a gas can and return it to their car. Once the player fuels the car, they can proceed to the next level of the game. These items function like a key and a lock. I use this behavior to make two new classes. The first class I made is the key item. Like previous items, the player interacts with it by walking into it. Once the player picks the key item up, it will disappear and instantly unlock a locked item. I drew this sprite for the gas can in A sprite and implemented it into the game. With that, the key item is finished. Next, I needed to design the locked item or the car. I started by drawing the car in A sprite. I spent many iterations trying to find a good looking sprite in limited 1 bit and 16 by 16 sprite size. It took me a while and you can see all my iterations here, but I'm really happy with the final result. Oftentimes, doing art in such a limited style can almost feel like solving a puzzle rather than drawing. Next, I coded the locked item class. A locked item is also a trigger item, but this time it will not work until the player has unlocked it. To unlock it, they'll have to pick up the key item or the gas can we made earlier. Now that we have the car item, we need the car to progress to the next level once it's interacted with. I initially thought of using a text prompt to ask the player if they wanted to go to the next level, but this went against my design pillars. Instead, I thought I would do something more interactive by popping up the car dashboard as if you were hopping into the car. The player can touch the key icon to drive the car and proceed to the next level. Or they can tap the stop hand to get out of the car if they want to continue searching for items in the current level. Now that the player could proceed through levels, I needed a way to seamlessly link them together. Of course, I didn't have to work on these effects for the MVP, but a little bit of extra effort will tie the gameplay experience together. 
I came up with this technique to dither the screen using a large dither sprite that simply moves across the screen using a do tween animation. Next I wanted to represent how many days the player has survived so far. The end goal of the game is to survive 28 days, but for now the player can play indefinitely. I came up with a class called Typewriter which slowly types out the number of what day it is during that level transition we made earlier. I made this effect using coroutines, where I can customize the speed and delay of how fast the text is typed to the screen. While this new UI might go against my design pillars, I like the survival horror aesthetic of using a typewriter. This effect gets the job done and it's good enough for my MVP. Before moving on, I wanted to fix some input issues I was having on mobile. In the old version, you had to press and release the direction you wanted to move. Now you can simply slide your finger across the D-pad without lifting your finger and causing a hand strain. My next big task was to implement the Game Master. A Game Master is generally any script that controls the game flow of a scene. For example, in sports this might be the referee, the scoreboard itself, or even the rules of the game. In Dungeon and Dragons it would be the Dungeon Master. For my purpose, the Game Master will control the turn order of the game, generating new levels and checking for a game over state. To implement the Game Master, I'm using a singleton design pattern. In programming, a singleton is an object that can only have one of them in existence and can be referenced from anywhere in the code. It's similar to having a global variable, but for objects. Here's the general flow of what the Game Master does in each level. First, it asks the maze generator to create a new maze. Secondly, it creates a list of all characters in the level, including players and enemies. It then generates a stack that is the turn order for the current round of the game. Once all players and enemies have taken their turn, the round is over and a new round starts. If the player gets the gas can and leaves in the car, the Game Master will generate a new level and repeat the process from the beginning. However, if the player dies in the process, it is game over and the players return to the main menu of the game. Oh man, you making a game in here? Yeah, I'm just working on my game right now. Pretty easy to do, actually. I didn't think it'd be so easy. Make sure you don't use instantiate or destroy all the time. Huh? Oh yeah, don't worry about that. I'm sure it'll be fine. One of the biggest mistakes you can make in Unity 3D is to make frequent calls to destroy and instantiate. This causes significant performance hits and if you're expecting to make a game for mobile, you should take the optimization very seriously. The solution is a design pattern called object pooling. Have you ever played a game where the blood or particles disappear after a certain amount of them have spawned? This is because a lot of games use this pattern. Rather than instantiate objects, object pooling will have a list of objects that are constant in memory. In my game, I have a maximum of four item boxes. So the item box pooler already has four of them hiding from the view. Then whenever I need an item box inside the maze, I make a request from the pooler for one. I'm not making a new item box every time I need one. Instead, they're hidden from view and they spawn when I need them to be. The final step of object pooling is that when an object dies or gets used, we do not destroy it. Instead, we hide it from view and save it somewhere else to be used later. With the use of object pooling, I haven't made a single call to instantiate or destroy throughout this entire project. This will keep the game's performance optimized and consistent across all platforms. Try making an object pooler before you get too far along in your project and the performance is terrible. And with that, we come to the last feature for the MVP, enemies. To begin making the enemies, I drew a lot of iterations on a zombie in A Sprite. It took me a very long time to find something I was happy with, but I found my look by accident when I was drawing a death animation for the zombie. I drew the head at an angle and I quickly realized that the jaggy pixels looked like an open mouth with teeth, and with that I found my zombie design. I hopped into the editor and began coding the enemy character. Since the enemy has all the same attributes as a player character, all I needed was a way to control their decision making process. I decided to use a system I call the Enemy Brain. An Enemy Brain is a class that controls the enemy character. Using information gathered by its surroundings, such as what spaces are available and how far away the player is, the Enemy Brain will make a decision for the enemy. 
Here's a flowchart I made for enemy brain decision making. First, it checks that the player is within detection range. If they are, the zombie will chase the player down. The zombie will then check what spaces are available for it to move. From those available spaces, it will choose the one that will get it closest to the player. If the zombie is close enough to the player to attack, it will deal 1 damage to the player. However, if the zombie is not within range of the player, it will patrol the maze instead. The zombie will continue in a straight line if possible. If it reaches a dead end in its current direction, the zombie will then choose a new direction that is not back the way it came. This will force the zombie to continually explore the map and ideally find the player. The last step was to add the zombie into the game. When the maze generates a new level, it will try to spawn zombies inside of dead ends, and then in pathways. Again, this is using object pooling to keep the game efficient. When the zombie is spawned inside the maze, it will notify the game master and be added to the turn order. Once the player makes a decision for their turn, all the other enemies inside the turn order will perform their turns simultaneously so that the gameplay never slows down. After some playtesting, I knew I needed a way for the player to attack the enemy when they were out of ammo. I don't like the idea of the player having absolutely no options when they run out. In Ace Sprite, I animated a bunch of knife attacks, then I implemented them into the game. Now the player will instantly pull out their knife and attack the enemy if they walk directly into one, consuming one turn. I noticed that you lose positional advantage if you have to move every turn. I decided to add the ability to skip your turn and stay in place by pressing and holding on the top half of the screen. With this new action, the player can simply wait for the zombie to walk into their line of sight rather than be forced to walk into a zombie and risk losing their health. And with that, we're about done with the MVP. I could stop here and move on to playtesting, but I felt that there was still some confusion left in the gameplay to fix before I send it off to other people. The first one being health. I implemented a simple health bar with the player's portrait over it. When the player takes damage, the health bar shakes and goes down by one. When the player gets healed, it plays an animation similar to the bullets where they move into the bar one by one. Lastly, I create a quick title screen mockup with a dithered cityscape and a hiker and a cat. When the player taps the screen, they start the game. When they die, it simply returns them to the title screen for now. With the MVP finished, it's time to play test. I'm going to send the build out to some friends and see what they think of it so far and fix any bugs that show up. I made sure to get a video out before moving on because the amount of content I had to cover was getting way too big. The next step for the game is moving towards an alpha build. While I still have a lot more development to do, my plan for now is to get back to the documentation board and decide on my next move. Thanks for tuning in this week. I hope to see you again. Keep making games.